Let me just go ahead and get started and show you what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about sonar technology. We're going to talk about Dual Beam Plus and what Dual Beam Plus means and what it is showing you from the Humminbird standpoint as a marine electronic manufacturer. We're going to delve a lot into side imaging, okay, because that is a very important aspect of fishing. We're going to talk about down imaging. I'm going to hope to demystify chirp for you and explain to you what chirp means because we've all heard that. And then we're going to talk about GPS and marking waypoints and how you can use it. And most of all, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to teach you things that you can utilize to go catching and not just fishing, okay? You're going to hear me talk a lot about Humminbird stuff because that's who pays my salary. I get paid by Humminbird. So we're going to talk about that, but it is applicable to the other brands too. And I will say this, it is Ford versus Chevy. All of the marine electronics, or most of the marine electronics that are out there are very good marine electronics. My theory is, is that the 80-20 rule, it's that 80% of the people out there using marine electronics don't know how to use 20% of the marine electronic. Anybody agree with that? There we go, all right, good deal. So let's get started and see if we can teach, teach us something. Uh, let me say this, first of all, uh, Humminbird is the only marine electronic manufacturer that builds and assembles our products in the USA. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we build them in Eufaula, Alabama. I will say that they're built from transistors and diodes and all those things, including screens that do come from Asia because we don't build that stuff in the United States anymore. And there's some of it built. I shouldn't say we don't build any of it, but most of it is not. Most of it is built overseas. We bring it over. We do all the assembly in Eufaula. We have an engineering office in Alpharetta, which is what I work out of. We have about 50 engineers uh, that work every day to do some aspect of building these marine, marine electronics so that we can effectively catch fish. The first thing that I want to talk to you about is what you're seeing below your boat. How many of you, how many of you are running Humminbird? How many of you are running somebody else's equipment? All right. How many of you have side imaging on your equipment? Okay. Of you that have side imaging, do you use it? All right. I'm going to show you reasons why to use it because it's incredible. I can tell you that uh, day before yesterday, I was fishing in Lake Lanier, which is just north of Atlanta. It's a 38,000 uh, acre impoundment. It has the same striped bass in it that we catch up here. I fish all over the country. I fish up here a lot uh, because I'm a striped bass guy. I started the striped bass tour for FLW and I target striped bass. I target them all over the country. I was just telling Joey back there with the camera that uh, one of the best places to catch striped bass inland in the entire United States is out of Knoxville, Tennessee. I will go there in a couple of weeks and we'll catch a number of 40 to 50 pounders. They're in the river. They're in six or eight feet of water, and it is insane. So that striped bass is my first love. But let, let's talk about what you're seeing below the boat. Okay, so most marine electronics out of their transducer, what they're doing is they are doing multiple frequencies, depending on what you have. Most 2D or regular sonar frequencies are 83 or 200 kilohertz, okay? If you are a, use, utilizing a saltwater transducer, you will probably have a 50 kilohertz uh, in uh, a transducer. So you'll have 250 or 283. 200 kilohertz is going to typically be doing a 20 degree cone angle. It's like an upside down ice cream cone. 83 is going to be doing a 60 degree cone angle. And uh, 50 degree, it depends on what transducer it is as to what cone angle you might be doing, it could be an 11 degree, okay? So here's the difference and here's the rule of thumb of the angle of the dangle. On 200 kilohertz, so at a 20 degree, what you're seeing is a third of the distance to the bottom at the bottom in terms of real estate. So to put that into perspective, this room, the ceiling in this room, I don't know exactly what it is, but let's say it's 30 feet deep. 30 feet deep means that you're gonna be seeing 10 feet of real estate at the bottom. On a 60 degree, that means you're going to be seeing 30 feet at the bottom because you're going to be seeing equal to the depth of water that you're fishing in on that particular frequency. All right? And then on down imaging, it depends on which frequency you're listening to or looking at. Uh, you have 455 and you have 800. On 800, 
uh, on, my, on my gear, you're gonna be looking at um, 45 degrees, and on 455, you're gonna be looking at 86 degree. But it's not a cone angle, it's just a little bitty slice. So that's what this is putting into perspective for you. This cone that you see at the middle right here would actually be your 200 kilohertz. This cone that you see right here would be your 83 kilohertz. And then what you're seeing here is this thin slice that would be your down imaging. And then what you're seeing over here is gonna be your side imaging. So when I get into this, you're gonna see what I'm talking about as we get more into it. We have something called Dual Beam Plus. And what Dual Beam Plus does is it takes the combination of the 20 degree and the 60 degree and it actually has the put those onto your screen simultaneously and what that does for you is it gives you a great deal of bottom coverage but it also allows that narrower beam to see down into those crevices and cracks, creek channels, limestone, whatever it happens to be and it allows you to see those fish that you might not otherwise see because it's spanning across that greater area on the bottom. And this is just kind of depicting what it is that it's giving you the ability to see. On the signal that's coming out of the transducer, remember I told you it's that upside down ice cream cone? This is what it looks like at the bottom. And it's going to be the strongest in the middle. And as you get out to the edges, it's going to become a weaker signal. So all, almost all marine electronics manufacturers measure that in plus or minus 10 dB. That's some kind of an engineering term. I'm not an engineer, I'm a fish head. I like to go catch fish. So, but I do know that that's the way that they measure that. They measure that in plus or minus 10 dB because it is a sound wave that's being sent through water. All right? So I can tell a number of things by utilizing the dual beam plus technology. If I just look at this particular screen snapshot right here, then I can tell that this is the creek channel, not just because it drops off, but I can tell because what's happening right here, you can see that the red beam is very narrow and that's because of the muck and mud that washes into those low areas and it's absorbing that sound that's coming out of that sonar transducer. Consequently, it doesn't have a lot of reflectivity like this over here. If I were on higher ground and there was you know, solid footing from where there was not a river there before or where there was it, all the soft dirt had washed off before the tides came in, if this was a tidal area or whatever it happened to be, Basically, it's going to have a lot of reflectivity because it has rocks and hard ground. It's not that muck that washes off into those low-lying areas. Whoops. This is giving you an example of what it would look like if you were looking at each beam individually. So this is a tree. I know we don't have trees in, in salt water and standing water, but we do have other structure. And this is what that tree would look like between the two beams. This is 200 kilohertz. And because the, the beam is narrower, it actually has the ability to give me a better, uh, a better view of what that is below the boat. On the 83 kilohertz, it's not going to give it to me better, but it's actually going to show a better arch because of the amount of real estate that it's looking at. These are some advantages that you have from utilizing the two on max mode and clear mode. We have a clear mode and a max mode, and you can pick that. Max mode is going to show you everything in the water Clear mode is going to get rid of some of that stuff. It's basically a filter, all right? So what happens is, whether it's the ocean or whether you're fishing in fresh water, is that debris either washes off the bank, it blows out of a tree, it hits the water. When it first hits the water, that debris is going to be positively buoyant. So it's going to stay up at the surface. As it starts to become waterlogged, it becomes neutrally buoyant, and then it becomes negatively buoyant, meaning that it's sinking down through the water column itself. If you're moving in your boat and you have your sonar on, as you go over the top of that piece of a tree or that piece of leaf or whatever it is that's in the water column, it's gonna reflect that sound back to you and it's gonna show up as stuff that's up in the water column. You know how you see that stuff all over your screen sometimes and you're going, what is that? That's exactly what it is. It's that debris that's washed off into the water and you're seeing it on there and you think that it might be a fish. It's going to look like an arch a lot of times. And the reason why it looks like an arch is because if I go back to this, remember the signal is weaker out here. Remember it's an upside down ice cream cone. You think about this. If my hand were stuck out in the water and I passed over it with the sonar, it is a farther distance from here to here than it is from here to here. See how much longer that line is? 
So as I'm moving across there and it first picks up my hand, it picks up my hand on the leading edge of that cone. As it gets into the center of it, it's a narrower distance or shorter distance. And then it's a farther distance again. That's what creates the arch that looks like a fish on your sonar machine, okay? is the distance that it has on the leading edge and the trailing edge versus right over the top of that object or in the center of the strongest field of that sound wave coming out. And it has nothing to do with the way that that fish is oriented to the sonar or your vessel. Absolutely zero to do with it. It just has to do with that uh, principle right there. Here's some examples of switch fire. These things in the water right here, these are probably not fish. They could be, they could be a very small fish. When I'm looking for fish, I'm looking for something that has yellow in it if this is the palette that I'm using because if it has yellow in it, that's telling me that it is a bigger fish and particularly a striped bass. And for those of you that only have sonar that don't have uh, side imaging or down imaging, which after this I hope you'll consider picking up down imaging, side imaging technology and I think you'll see why. But I'll tell you this, this is a little tip for you. If you're wanting to know what your fish that you're targeting looks like on your machine on a regular basis, when you're out there and you catch your target species, take that fish and either leave it on the hook on your rod and reel or take the, take the hook off of it and tie a little piece of fishing line on it. When I say little piece, I mean like six or eight feet and put that fish on the cleat on the back of your boat where your transducer is and just sit still and let that fish swim back and forth underneath your transducer and look at what that fish looks like. You know what size it is, now you know what it looks like on your screen and if you're utilizing my equipment and you put an SD card in and you go over to accessories and you turn on screen snapshot, every time you press the mark button on your unit it's going to take a picture just like this right here that you can take back to your computer at your house and you can download that picture and you can look at it and you can study it and see what it looks like. And when you're out there and you see those fish, if you'll take that picture, this is tip number two, if you'll take those pictures every time you see something that looks like that and you want to understand it or you want to catalog it, log it, as in fish log, to keep up with what you caught, and then when you catch those fish out there and you take a picture of them with your smartphone or your camera, Take all those pictures and put them in one folder utilizing that day's date. Next year when you start to go out fishing and you come back and you look at the screen snapshot and you see where you were, you see what the depth was, if you have your temp up, you see what the temperature is, you know what the date is, you see what kind of fish you caught that day. If you take pic screen snapshots that have your map up, it'll have the map on there. Basically, basically what you're doing is you're creating a log of pictures that when you start to go next year, you can go look at those water temperatures, time of day, what kind of fish you caught, where you caught it, and all that kind of stuff. And you can look at it as a snapshot, and you can look at a two or three week period. When you get out there, that's a great way to be able to cut to the chase and narrow down where you're fishing. All right? So on with it. This right here, utilizing a switch fire, is actually on the 83 kilohertz side because it's looking at such a broad view. And what this right here is, is a three-quarter ounce flexit spoon, which is a very small spoon, and I'm just jigging it up and down underneath the boat. And I can see the spoon going up and down, and then I can see the fish coming up to look at my spoon, uh, and hopefully to bite my spoon, so that I can catch a fish. I'm going to go right into side imaging now, because this, as I started out at the beginning, is one of the most important things that you can utilize. In Atlanta, three days ago when I was going out fishing, I wanted to catch some big gizzard shad and I wanted to catch blueback herring. Yes, we have blueback herring in most of the lakes. You would be amazed. And most of these blueback herring this time of the year are this big. They're awesome baits. I wanted to catch bait and if I'm going over with my 2D sonar and I'm looking for bait, how many of you catch bait? Do any of you throw a cast net or do you all use snatch hooks? Okay, so you know when you go over the top of bait and you see it on your sonar, have you ever thrown your cast net and brought it back in and had not absolutely one bait in it? Okay, so if you don't see the bait flipping on the surface, if you do see them flipping on the surface, that's a dead giveaway. You know which side of the boat to throw the cast net on. But those times when you know that they're there because you're seeing them on your sonar, but you're not catching them, you don't know what's going on, side imaging tells you what's going on. 
In my case, I was able to ride up a creek with a cast net ready to roll. I was ready to throw the cast net. I'm riding up the creek. Whenever those baits start to show up on my side imaging, I not only know where they are, I know which side of the boat to throw the cast net on because just because they show up on 2D sonar doesn't mean that they're cast netable. They may have been on this side and because I'm right handed I naturally wanted to throw the cast net on the right side of the boat. Okay? But side imaging is going to show me that. Let me, that's because it has the ability to look at up to 480 feet. Let me put that into perspective. For those of you that only have 2D sonar, this is our pond in this building right here. This is not a huge building. It's 30 feet deep. Remember I told you how much you could look at on the bottom? So on the bottom, I can ride down and look at 10 feet. You think about this, this aisleway right here is more than 10 feet. You just look at this, this carpet right here behind me, the blue carpet, and you imagine how many times I've got to go down and back, down and back, down and back, down and back just to canvas this building. With side imaging, I could go right down the building this way or this way and see from wall to wall and mark anything in between. I promise you it works. Okay? So here, here's, a, here's an example of that. I told you our building was in Eufaula, Alabama. We have a huge corporate campus in Eufaula and it is on uh, Lake Eufaula, which is a very large impoundment. It's relatively shallow for the most part, but it is a very large lake. I think it's something like 60,000 acres. Okay? This is out in the cove by our building and you can see these bridges going over. You can't tell from this other than seeing the bridge, but I promise you it is two bridges. There are two lanes going north and two lanes going south. Okay? From this I can see that I'm in 32 feet of water. Remember how much I can see in 32 feet of water? I can see slightly over 10 feet of bottom. Okay? But on this I'm looking at 240 feet left, 240 feet right. I can see the bridge columns going down into the water on the left side. I can see where the creek channel goes underneath the bridge. I can see exactly where the center of the creek channel is. I can even see the old bridge on the other side that went across the creek before they filled the lake up and dammed it up in 1952. That's a lot of stuff that I can see from that particular uh, shot. Here's another one of another bridge where I can see. This is what I'm talking about about bait. I see that there's bait on both sides of my boat, but look at where most of the bait is. It's on the left side of the boat. And knowing that is really going to help me whether it's bait or whether it's fish. Here's another example. This is from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, these are, look at all the fish out to the right side. Look at my regular 2D sonar. For those of you that only have 2D sonar, I only see bait on there. Do you see any fish on there? That, might, that's, that looks like a fish right there. But the rest of that is all bait. But look at side imaging. I see a whole school of striped bass right here out to the side of the boat. You see how far they are from my boat? They're two boat lengths from my boat. And I can see them on side imaging. You starting to believe in side imaging now? It really does work, I promise you. It is not a smoke and mirrors. It is a real recreational fishing technology that is affordable. I can see the grass. I'm in eight feet of water. I would only be looking at a little bit of bottom in eight feet of water. Less than three feet. Okay? But I can see the grass out to the side of the boat 60 feet. Can I see fish? I can see fish. Because that beam is so narrow, it's only this thick. It's like a fan going like this, but it's only this thick. It's lopped off. It's not an upside down ice cream cone. If a fish is facing the side of my boat like this, I'm not going to see it. If the fish is parallel to the side of my boat, I'm going to see it just like you can see all these fish on both sides of my boat. And I can see the shadows from the fish. That gives me some indication as to how high off the bottom those fish are. I can't tell exactly, but I have a pretty good idea that they're up off the bottom. This was like three weeks ago. Any of you freshwater fish? Do you ever go catch crappie? great to eat. It's a great, I call them tacos actually. So I was going out and I was looking for tacos. And what I did was, remember all of your screens only have a certain number of pixels. If I'm looking at my Onyx, my Onyx has uh, uh, 1024 by 768. So I got 768 pixels this way and I got 1024 pixels this way. 
If I'm trying to look at both sides of side imaging, and I'm trying to share the screen with down imaging, just like I'm doing here, how big does something have to be to show up? How many pixels is it? How do I get it bigger to where I can see it? For those of you that have side imaging, you can go and just look at one side. I can look at right side or left side. In this particular case, I'm looking at right side. So this time of the year before these fish start to spawn, they pre-spawn, they get themselves underneath docks and they're hiding in the shade as they're getting ready to spawn before they move up into the real shallow sticks where it's only two or three or four feet deep and they nest and, and, and spawn. They'll, they'll, they'll get into an area just like this. This is a big rock right here, and these are all crappie that are holding over the top of the rock. And I could ride down the slips of a dock, and it could be a dock that's longer than the building is this way, and I can turn my side imaging on and just look at the side the dock's on and slowly ride down with my boat almost touching the dock as I go by, and I can determine which one of those slips those fish are in. Without side imaging, I could go there and shoot my jig up into the dock or cast. For those of you that don't know how to shoot, that's an incredible technique where you grab your little jig and you pull the end of your rod back right underneath your rod and you can literally shoot underneath the tie lines that are holding the boat to the side. Be happy to show you how to do it. It is an incredible technique. It'll, you can't cast that way. You can't cast because of the tie lines. But I can shoot right beside the dock, between the dock and the boat, and get all the way up underneath the dock where I can catch these crappy crappie, sockele, white perch, whatever you want to call them. But more importantly, by picking just the right side of the screen, I have the ability to look at just that size, that side, and everything is twice as big because of the aspect ratio. Here's an example of utilizing side imaging to mark structure on the bottom. This is salt water. This is out of Port St. Lucie, Florida. This is a barge that's 200 feet long. Think about if I were going over it with 2D sonar, and this is the barge right here, this table. Because I'm using just 2D sonar and because it's a farther distance on the outside of that cone angle, as I approach it, it's going to start to pick it up and instead of it being squared off like this table or like this barge might be, what's going to happen is, is it's going to show a relief that's going to ramp up like this, it's going to go flat across the top and then it's going to ramp down on the other side of it, but I really don't know what it is. If I went across it this way, it's going to be a very short ramp up, ramp down, okay? But with side imaging, I have the ability to mark all four corners of the barge and then I can set still and look at the waypoints on my GPS and see which way the current, the wind, or whatever is moving my boat and I can utilize that information to go either anchor or I can go use my Minn Kota trolling motor which we also make at Johnson Outdoors and I can hit spot lock and spot lock's going to hold me right here. I can tell you that on this boat I did this mark, I came and put myself right there on the, on the, this is the deep water side. This is going out in the ocean this way. I, I, I very distinctly remember this, and I'll show you why in a second, or at least one of the reasons why. But I was able to mark all four corners of this barge on the bottom. I pulled myself back up here with my big motor. I put my trolling motor down, and I pressed spot lock. I went back to my bait well, and I got myself a couple of Menhaden and put them on to, a, to, I put one on one rod, and the other gentleman put one on another rod. And that was what I caught. That was one of the species I caught. That's probably a 350 pound Goliath grouper. Okay? I also caught a 24 pound snook. For any of you that are saltwater fishermen that have ever snook fished, a 24 pound snook is a big motor scooter. It is a huge fish. But knowing where that structure is out to the side of your boat is going to help you catch more fish. If I'm in shallow water and I go up into that shallow water, I'm going to spook those fish. If I see those fish tailing to get away or I see where they made some tur uh, turbulence or, or disturbance in the water as they try to get away, I just spooked them. There's no way I'm going to catch that fish. And this is a good example of that. So this is really shallow water. It's four feet deep. If you will recall in four feet deep, anybody remember how much I can see in four feet? About a foot, a little over a foot of water, of bottom is all I can see. But look at what I'm looking at here. I'm looking at 75 feet right, 75 feet left, and these are bluegill beds. 
And I don't know if you can see them or not, but these little white dots on here are the actual bluegill in the beds. So every one of those white spots that you see in those beds are bluegill. Now remember what I told you about picking one side and being able to see it better? Can you see the bluegill on the beds now better? Because I just picked one side. I take, I'm on 63 feet, but I can actually see those better in the beds now than I could see before. I can see the creek channels. I can mark the creek channels. I didn't know where they went, but now I have the ability to mark those creek channels. I can mark ditches or runoffs, which are areas that typically hold fish, whether it's in fresh water or whether it's in salt water. I'm using my, my electronics uh, to be able to, to find those fish. I don't know if any of you have ever fished in uh, Connecticut, but let me give you a, a scenario that would be very similar to what you're fishing out here at Sandy Hook or wherever you're fishing for striped bass. So one of the things that happens up here, at least that I've done up here, is I'm fishing in a race. What creates a race? The thing that creates a race is a point that's going out that has boulders and rocks on it that don't wash away. So when the tide's coming in, it's all going one way. When the tide's going out, it's going a different way. So what do we do up here? We go, we catch porgies or we catch pogies or menhaden, whatever you want to call them. And I know those are two different species. Porgy is one species. Pogies or menhaden are the same species, all right? So I'm going and I'm catching my bait that I'm going to live bait fish with. So what I do is I go to where this race is. Race is going out from the point. This one right here, if you're familiar with Connecticut, uh, the guys from JMB Tackle, this is right in front of Kyle's house. This is called Black Point. Big boulders there. What I do is I go in with my porgies or my pogies. I maybe start out really close to shore early in the morning. The tide's going this way. I run into the tide or I go around the point, get on the other side. I drop my bait all the way down to the bottom. I start out where I'm in maybe 35 or 40 feet of water. The boat starts to move. I start taking line up and making sure that I'm keeping touch with the bottom as it gets shallower and shallower. I try to get a bite. I get over the other side. I drop it back down for a couple of, a couple of drops down. I pull it in. I rinse and repeat. I go back around the point. I look at where my track was on my GPS. I move myself out 25, 30, 40, 50 feet or whatever, I rinse and repeat and I continue to do that. When I get a bite, I go back and try to start at the same spot that I just was fishing from where I got the bite. What I do not know is I do not know where this boulder is and this boulder is and this boulder is that have the highest propensity to hold those big cow stripers behind them because I never used side imaging and marked those boulders so I knew where they were with the waypoint. All right. Doing this and utilizing side imaging and even doing just one side, remember I told you about one side? I could have just picked the one side and rode all the way down the side of this race to where I got into deeper water and marked those boulders. What I also know is that as the, as the, as the uh, tide level continues to pick up pace, you know when, it first, when the tide first turns it starts out and it's moving real slow and as I get closer to the top or the bottom of the tide, it's moving faster, right? Whether it's going out or it's going in, it's moving faster. We well, think about this. If it's coming in and I'm trying to effectively fish this, the closer I get to the higher tide, the faster the tide goes, right? So the faster the tide goes, you think about this. As the water's coming down the bay and it hits this point, what does it do? It goes, it follows the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is going to the deeper side of the point or the race. So now I can't do the, the, the if I did, a, if I did a, a float, a drift, and I floated straight here, when I move back up, I promise you I'm not gonna do exactly the same float. Because what's gonna happen is, is that as that tide picks up, it starts to follow that path of least resistance and it continues to curl or hook out toward the deeper part of that, uh, that point going out of that race. So what, I have learned to do from being a freshwater fisherman and adapting this into saltwater is utilizing a trolling motor. And what I do is call, I call it controlled slip drift. So what I do is I'll go up, I'll, mark, I'll go by and I'll mark these boulders. Once I mark them, I have them on there forever. I go up and I utilize my trolling motor and I put my trolling motor down and I use my trolling motor to guide my boat somewhat as I start to go back and also to slow it down because when I get closer to high tide and that boat is going at four miles an hour, 
that is hauling tail to be able to find the bottom. I may have to put eight or ten ounces or more weight on there just to be able to get it down to the bottom for a split second. When the tide gets really strong, those rocks right there are the ones that are going to almost always hold that big fish. He's going to sit behind that tide. The big fat fish are lazy. They sit down there and just hold themselves there and they're just kind of watching for something to come by that rock so they can go up and ambush it, right? That's how I'm utilizing side imaging and that's how I'm utilizing my trolling motor. Now let's talk a little bit about down imaging. What down imaging gives me the ability to do that 2D sonar doesn't because it works like an MRI machine, it's that little bitty narrow band. Remember I told you it's only this thick? It has the ability to give me incredible detail. This is a tree that's on the bottom and I can see every single limb in it. You see that same kind of stuff in salt water, it's just that you don't have very many trees unless there's a hurricane that comes or something like that. Then you maybe have some trees out there that are structure and you want to see where they are and how they're lying on the bottom. Incredible detail. This is actually a shooting blind and if you see over here you can see how deep it is. A shooting blind is this little box that's maybe five by five or six by six that has shooting windows in it that has a tin roof on it that before this lake was impounded this is something that a guy was hunting out of, no doubt. It's by a creek over here, but I can see that it has a tin roof on it because of the reflectivity of the sound wave coming back off of it. You would never see anything like that on 2D sonar. It's impossible for it to give you that kind of detail. Here's another example. This is in Lake Lanier before they filled up Lake Lanier in 1957. There was a bridge that went over the Chattahoochee, which was the main river that feeds into that uh, as a tributary. And I can see the guardrail on the, on the ramp going up to the bridge. I can see all the still structure of the bridge and it's 120 feet underneath. So if you're going out to the lumps or you're going somewhere out there to, to, to fish, so long as you're in less than, depending on what size you're looking for, maybe 150 feet of water, this stuff works incredibly well. And up here, we can only fish inside the three mile, right? So you're in water that's relatively shallow. Unless you're going out in Long Island Sound, in the middle of it, you're going to find some depths that are pretty deep. But if you're over at Plum Gut or you're at some of those areas, you're over at Port Jeff, you're fishing, you know, some of those areas, you're definitely going to be able to use side imaging effectively to be able to find out where those fish are. This is another example of down imaging, and I'm going to touch on chirp a little bit with it. And the reason why I am is because I'm utilizing a chirp transducer. Uh, this is high dollar. This, to give this view right here, it's over $4,000 just to get this view right here with chirp, okay? And that has nothing to do with the head unit that it's displaying it. That's just the two transducers and the broadband sonar module, all right? I can see the brush and I can see the fish out to the side of the brush and I can tell that they're here on 2D sonar, but I still can't see them like I can on down imaging. More examples of down imaging. Regular 200 kilohertz transducer. I can see the trees here and here, but look how much detail I can see from down imaging. It's incredible. These are all down imaging shots. Here's an example of looking. I'm looking at chirp. I see this over here. I think that it's brush. I don't know if there's any fish in it. I see this over here. It looks like brush, but to me, I've looked at it enough. I've looked at this stuff thousands of hours. I know that that's fish, but let me show you how good down imaging will show you that it's fish. So here's the same shots. Here's the one you were looking at back here. That shot and that shot. Now look at down imaging. Look how much detail I can see on what that is underwater. And look at this one, how I can see the tree and I see the fish all up over the top of the tree. It's pretty incredible what it has the ability to show you. This is on our new uh, Helix 12 Chirp unit. This is where Chirp has the ability to show me on the 2D sonar that this object right here is up off the bottom. I can see this line going through here and I know that that is a big fish on the bottom. Okay? And I don't know if you can see it over here, but there's that big fish on the bottom because I've got it split screen between down imaging and 2D sonar. And in the event that you can't see it, I've taken this picture right here, I can move my cursor over the top of this and I can hit plus and zoom in on it. And that's what it looks like. So here's the same one you saw over there. I just grabbed and cut and pasted that into my PowerPoint. And here it is where I moved my box over the top of it and zoomed in on it. And I can darn near see the eyeball on the fish and I can see the tail of the fish. 
You will never, ever, ever, ever see that on 2D sonar. This is what the down imaging transducer looks like, or one of them. Remember that upside down ice cream cone I talked about? It comes out of a round ceramic. It's a wafer. And that's why it is an upside down ice cream cone, because it's sending that signal out of the center of it, as opposed to out of the long ceramic that has the ability to do down imaging. And that's why I get an upside down ice cream cone. That right there is my piezo that gives me my temp out of that particular transducer. This is the transducer that goes with our Onyx unit. It has a dedicated down imaging transducer. It has a dedicated side imaging for left side and right side. And then this is that ceramic that the 2D sonar comes out of uh, in the front of the transducer housing. What is CHIRP? You, I've, seen, I've given you some examples of it. It stands for Compressed High Intensity Radar Pulse. And there are multiple versions of CHIRP. There is what I call a lesser expensive or cheaper chirp. It has the ability to use multiple frequencies, but not like a low Q Airmar chirp transducer. That's who came out with it. Most of your low Q stuff is real high dollar. It's mostly used by anglers and commercial fishermen that are fishing offshore in very deep depths. And that's because it has the ability to give better target separation and definition, like what you saw in the previous slide of the big fish being separated from the bottom. If you were looking at regular 200 kilohertz, you would see what looked like a rock on the bottom. You would never see separation, almost never would you see separation, but it depends on the depth, all right? But chirp is very expensive, and this is what it does, and this is how it works. This is the simplest uh, example that I can give you. The regular 200 kilohertz or 83 kilohertz is coming out of a tone burst transducer. That means that it's sending out a signal and it's grabbing the signal coming back. It's sending out a single signal or it's sending out two signals, 83200, 8350, right? All right, so Chirp on the other hand, what it's doing is it's sending out multiple frequencies. If you notice down in the bottom left hand corner of what I showed you over here, you see that number right there? That is a transducer ID. That is telling me that that transducer is sending out uh, 175 to 225 kilohertz. So it's listening to 50 different frequencies almost simultaneously. This, it's kind of like this. When I'm sending out that single signal or I'm sending out two of them, it's click, 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 click. If you ever start your uh, transducer or your sonar unit when your boat's out of the water, you hear that clicking sound, it's trying to send that signal out into the airwaves. That's why you hear it clicking, all right? So whenever I'm listening to chirp, and I'm listening to, in the case of the Helix 12 chirp, I'm listening to 50 frequencies. It's like I pick a, a key on the keyboard of the piano over here, and I count down 50 keys, and I take my finger and just wipe it all the way across the, the uh, keyboard, and every time I hear it, I hear that tone change. That's what's happening with chirp, and that's why it has the ability to give uh, some better target separation and definition uh, than does a regular sonar transducer. And it kind of looks like this. Here's that same bridge you've seen before on 455. Here it is on chirp. I'm using a chirp low and a chirp medium transducer. These are low Q. They're less than four, which is a really good transducer. I'm listening to medium, which is 80 to 130. So I'm listening from 40 to 130. I'm listening to 90 different frequencies to do this and it's combined. And it's giving me great detail. Look at the arches I have on a fish right here. I see a fish right here. I see a fish right here and right here. It's showing me some things. I barely see the fish right here in the top of the bridge on the, on the down imaging. So it has the ability to give me some target separation and target definition. Again, as long as I'm in less than 50 feet for down imaging on 800 uh, kilohertz or 75 to 100 feet, on 455 or on side imaging, I'm in less than 150 feet of water. I can utilize down imaging and I can use, utilize side imaging to give me incredible detail. It's when I get into those deeper depths that CHIRP really does shine. These are just some more examples of utilizing CHIRP and DI. In this particular case, you can see I'm in 88 feet of water. I'm going 3.3 miles an hour. I can see the standing timber. I can see this little school of stripers above the timber. I have incredible arches on chirp, but I'm still seeing it really good on, on DI or down imaging. And this is off of the onyx. Some more examples of it. 
Look how I see the fish on here on chirp, but look how I actually see individual fish on DI. Those of you that are fishing fresh water, we do have something up here called Lake Master. It is our answer to charting. Uh, I'm going to show you something that you could do on some of the units without even having a Lake Master chart. We do not have any salt water for Lake Master. For those of you that are exclusively fishing salt water, you're going to utilize Navionics, just like you've always used, utilized Navionics for our equipment. Or if you're using the Onyx, you have the ability to utilize Seaman. Uh, um, but Lake Master is the ability to, for those of you in freshwater, as long as we have the lakes, it gives you the ability to set a shallow water safety contour. It gives you the ability to highlight a contour. It gives you the ability to offset a lake level. All right? So I've offset the lake level here. You can see the old full pool lake level right here. Once I offset it to what the lake pool is today as the lake goes down, it gives me the ability to see where the lake literally is now at full pool. And it also changes all of the IDs on here. So this one right here that says 20, before I offset the lake, it may have said 28 or 30. When I change it, it changes the numbers. I don't have to keep it in my head and go, oh, wait a minute, it said 30 before, it's really 20 now. It does it for me. The computer or the sonar unit does it for me. And this is what the, this is what the menu looks like where I do the water level offsets off of this. So here it is where I haven't offset the lake level. Here it is where I've done minus three feet and see how it changed uh, this, this shallow water hump to show that's exactly what it's going to do. It's also changed the numbers on the chart. So it said 10 before, now it says 7. Just an example of it. This is what I was alluding to on Auto Chart Live. So if you pick up one of our Helix 9s, 10s, or 12s, or Onyx units, or Ion units, you have the ability to create your own chart as you're running your vessel. It could be a little pond in your neighborhood. It could be going offshore where you have a bunch of waypoints that you fish. You just have the ability to enhance what it is uh, that you're seeing out there or if you don't have any charts to actually build a chart. So it looks like this. So this is down between Sanibel and Captiva. This is the Navionics chart over here. And this is where I actually ran and created a chart. It doesn't have depth labels on it because at the time I made this uh, slide, we didn't actually have the ability to put depth labels. With the software that we came out with last week, you now have the ability to create depth labels. It'll put the numbers on here and not just the colors. Here's another example of it. This is in someone's subdivision. They literally took Auto Chart Live and they created a chart for their little lake in their subdivision. Here's another example of it on a lake where I actually created that lake on the subdivision. And for those of you that have boats that you can utilize a trolling motor on, if you get our trolling motor that has an iPilot link on it, meaning that you can connect it to your sonar, you have the ability to follow the contour. So I can go out to this hump and just map this hump on this particular lake or in the ocean. I can deploy my trolling motor. I could pick that little bitty circle right there in the middle, and I could tell my trolling motor that I wanted to follow that little bitty circle up to 300 feet away from it. So I could pick one foot, two feet, 10 feet, 30 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet away from the circle. And if I pick 300 feet, my boat's just going to go in a circle 300 feet away from this until I tell it to stop or until my battery dies, whichever comes first. And I can be just gasping like crazy and not even having to drive my boat. It's an incredible technology. These are the line of Helix units. We have a five inch uh, with side imaging and down imaging that starts at 499. We go all the way up to the 12 uh, Chirp, which sells for $2,299 or $2,300. It has side imaging, down imaging, uh, 2D sonar. You have the ability to put two charts in it or two SD cards. You have the ability to set a shortcut uh, on the units themselves. On these three units, the, 10, uh, the, t the 9, 10, and 12, you have the ability to network them and set shortcuts on them and put two cards in them. The little one, again, $499, the big one, uh, $22.99. This is what the console of my boat looks like. I have two Onyx 10s in it. I have an autopilot and I have a balls out mount up on the top that I put uh, different units on whenever I'm doing testing or creating screen snapshots for marketing or for the rest of my training staff I do. 
and then that's the remote for my iPilot Link. And yes, I do exactly like the commercial. How many of you have seen the iPilot Link commercial, or I mean, the Altera commercial? Anybody seen that commercial? You got to see it. It's incredible. Go look it up. When I go launch my boat, I do not get in the boat. Except for to get in the boat and grab this off the bow or off the console, I make sure that it's fully charged. I turn on my trolling motor. I turn on my remote. I look at it and make sure that it says that it's connected to my trolling motor. When it does, it says motor stowed. I take the strap off the back. I take the strap off the front. I got a 25-foot uh, center console bay boat. I back my boat down into the water. I sit in my truck. I keep backing. I watch my boat float off of my trailer. I'm not saying we endorse this. I'm just saying I do this. I take the risk for it, okay? That's my disclaimer. As soon as I see my boat clearing the guides on the side of my trailer, I push the button. I deploy my trolling motor. I set a spot lock before I go out in front of the dock because I launch at the same dock a lot. I tell my trolling motor to take my boat to there and spot lock it. I drive up into the parking lot. I park my truck. I lock my cover on the back of my truck. I get my stuff out of the truck, I walk down to the boat, as I'm walking down there I go Whoosh. I just do that for looks, I turn my trolling motor around and I bring my boat over to the dock and I step off onto it and I turn around and away I go with the big motor. But it's an incredible technology, this is what that Altera looks like. I push the button and I can stow it, I can raise it and lower it. Um, it is an incredible trolling motor. This is what the remote looks like that comes with just the uh, Altera trolling motor. It is not available as yet with iPilot Link. It is only available with iPilot. iPilot gives me the ability to do spot locks. I can do cruise control. So if I'm trying to fish down the beach or I'm trying to fish the race, the race I can put this trolling motor on, which it comes in up to a 72-inch, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? comes into a 72 thank you it comes into up to a 72 inch shaft so I can put it on a high side boat I have plenty of guys that use it in the ocean they don't want to throw an anchor out they don't want to scope the anchor they don't want to have to pull it up and move over every time when the currents moving them and swinging them out and moving them away from their structure so they'll utilize the iPilot link on their uh, trolling motor uh, these are just some of the some of the uh, features that I've talked about the spot lock the record a track you have the ability to do I can run by the race and I can record the track and I can go back and run it with my trolling motor, right? That's what the remote looks like for the iPilot Link. And these are some of the functions for the iPilot Link. I can do spot lock, I can track record, autopilot, cruise control, co-pilot, go to and follow the contour. And the length of reach on that remote is about a thousand feet. So I could control my boat from pretty much anywhere in here. Again, we don't recommend it, I don't endorse it, but I do it, all right? Uh, follow the contour. I talked to you a little bit about this before. I showed you the top of that hump. We have the ability to follow this contour. I can move my cursor over and pick any contour line on here once I've made that contour with Auto Chart Live or I have it with Lake Master, and I can tell my unit to follow it, and on that remote, I can see all of that data. I can see what my speed over ground is, what my prop speed is, I can see what my bearing is, I can see all that information sent from my head unit to this remotely uh, via a, a Bluetooth connectivity. This is what that contour offset looks like that I was mentioning to you earlier. I can offset that contour by plus or minus 300 feet. I can go 300 feet inside of the contour or 300 feet outside of the contour and follow that contour so I can just lay my remote down or hang it on my neck and all I got to do is fish. Now think about that. If I don't have to control the boat and I can fish, that's pretty powerful. Uh, for those of you up here that may have an interest, it's more of a freshwater bass thing for sure, but we do make a shallow water anchor. I, I refer to it lovingly as a stick in the mud. I have the ability when I find fish, I can stick that down into up to 12 feet of water. It's going to hold me there and I can sit right there and fish without even using the trolling motor. So it's pretty cool that I have the ability to do that. For those of you that have more questions about how to utilize the product, let me make sure that you understand this. If, how many of you are familiar with YouTube? All right, if you'll go to YouTube, and then on YouTube you'll do a search for Humminbird TV. There is no G in Humminbird. It's not Hummingbird. That would be a proper noun which you cannot patent or trademark. 
it is Humminbird. And that's because whenever the, guy who, the guys who first started Humminbird started the company, it was Texonic Industries, and that little machine made a humming. And so they decided to make it, they decided to go in and try to trademark that. And when they sent it out, the guy uh, didn't know how to spell Humminbird, and he left the G out. And so when they looked at it, they said, oh, this isn't a proper noun. This is Humminbird. This is pretty cool. So they gave him the patent. So that's why we're called Humminbird, all right? But if you'll go in and you'll look up Humminbird TV as a channel on Facebook, I mean on uh, YouTube, and you'll subscribe to that, you will see literally dozens and dozens and dozens of videos that are anywhere from a minute to three or four minutes that will teach you how to do all of these cool features that I've mentioned today and then some uh, about how to operate our units. Also, for those of you on social media, if you will go to Facebook and you will like Humminbird as a Facebook page or become a fan of that Facebook page, every time that there's something up on our page, whether there's a seminar like this in your area, you will get a notification. You'll see it in your news feed. And then last but not least, you can go to Humminbird.com or MincotaMotors.com and you'll see all kinds of videos. You'll see product information on there that will help you to learn uh, more about the products that we have and learn more about fishing because we also do videos on there. On behalf of Johnson Outdoors, our parent company, Humminbird, uh, Minn Kota, and Canon, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about fishing and I hope I've demystified some of these technologies and how they work. Thank you very much.